facing an internal battle as well. Think about where they were. Think about, listen to me, Pastor. Think about the spiritual warfare on the inside of these boys. Think about the demonic warfare. If your God loves you, why has this happened? Am I preaching to anybody today? Huh? If your God loves you, why have you seemingly became a slave to the system? Huh? Why are you even in Babylon if your God loves you? Listen to me. Those boys were facing an external battle, but they were also facing an internal battle. You say, preacher, not me. I'm, I'm, I'm too, well, bless your heart. You're a spiritual giant because I've had battles internally where the devil come to me and said, why don't you just quit? Why don't you just hang it up? Hey, what you're fighting for is not worth fighting for. And I want to say to you, child of God, well, I'm thankful for the word of God, but I can look at society and tell you that we have got something to worth fighting for. Oh, there was something on the inside of them boys that reminded them that, uh, <laughs> That that wasn't their home. Have you ever been, Pastor, be honest? Boy, just about ready to throw in the towel. Huh? Man, you fall, you fall, you fall. Families busting apart in your church because they wait too long to come to the man of God for prayer and help and wisdom and counseling. Oh, the devil come to you and says you're not making no kind of difference anyway. But church, we've got to fight for that what's worth fighting for. They had a problem. They had a battle faced externally and internally. The battle they faced. Now, let's look real quickly at the building of their faith. They faced an external battle. Let's look at the building of their faith. I want to help you today because this helped me. Look with me in chapter number one, verse number eight. There was a process, child of God. There was a process to the building of their faith. Look with me real quickly in chapter number one, verse number eight. But Daniel... First thing he did, purpose in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor the wine, listen to me, which he drank. And therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said to Daniel, now listen to me, there was a process to the building of their faith. Them boys just didn't jump in the fire. There was a process to the building of what happens a lot of times we get ahead of God. We think we can handle the things that's coming our way, but we better understand there is a process to building up our faith. You couldn't pastor this church. Huh? No, 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 no. He's not been through too much. There's a process to building of our faith. These boys didn't just go jump in the fire. And I want to challenge you. Allow God to work out and work you through the process. Here comes the, here comes the, the eunuch. The Bible says that the prince of the eunuch said unto Daniel, I fear my Lord, the king who hath appointed me your meat and your drink. For why should he see your faces worse than like unto the children which are of your sort? Then shall you make me endanger my head. He said, look, the king puts you in my hand. I got to feed you. I got to give you a drink because if you go before him and you look weak and frail because you've not partook of what the king give you, he's going to have my head. Watch what Daniel. And then said Daniel to Melsar, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them not give us pulse, let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. And then let our countenance be looked upon before thee, and the countenance of the children that eat the portion of the king's meat. And as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So he consented to them in this matter and proved them ten days. This is oh, this is one of my favorite parts of the word of God. There was a process to them getting able to being able to get into that fire. Watch what the Bible says. At the end of the ten days, their countenance appeared fair and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. Listen to me. There was a process. I imagine that boys went back in there after ten days of giving them water. And Paul said, man, them boys were going to be about dead. Well, they've not partook in what the king had for them. And listen, they're dependent upon their big cheek God. But I'm going to say that they're sick and they're weak and they're frail. But I imagine they went back in there. They went back in there to check on them boys. And them boys was probably exercising, Brother Heath. Man, maybe they was posing a little bit. Man, they were stronger than ever, Brother Tim. Because they had forsook what the king had to offer and took what the king had to offer. I think, listen to me, we got to quit worrying about what we don't get out there and focus more on what we get in here. There was a process to the building of these boys' faith. There was a process. And now watch this. This is it right here. Listen. They were prospering, but they were not presuming. Watch this. They were prospering. God was blessing them, but they weren't presuming. Watch. Verse number 16, chapter 1. Then Melsar took away the portion of their meat 
and the wine that they should drink and gave them pulse. As for, little ch- as for the children, they gave knowledge and skill and learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days, the king had said to them, bring them in. Then the prince of the eunuchs brought them before uh, Nebuchadnezzar. And the king commanded them, listen to me. And among them all was found none. None, none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in this realm. Look with me in chapter 3 real quickly. I want to show you something. Boy, they helped me. They were prospering. Man, God was blessing them, but they was prospering, but they wasn't presuming. Listen to me now. Chapter number 3, verse number 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said unto the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of the hand, O king. Watch this. But if not, well, we need some but if nots in our, think we got a bunch of church people that are used to asking God for things and seeing God answer their prayers. We begin to petition the throne room of God. Well, we'll go back and over and over and over and we'll ask God for things. But boy, the first time he delays in his answer, well, we'll sit down and boy, we'll begin to doubt the hand of God. Oh, we've seen his miracles. We've seen what he's done in the past. We've seen how he's helped other people. I'm saying we, we are prospering, but we can't presume. We've got to say, God, this is my petition but oh God if not you're still God we get to get to that place in our life Lord I know I'm sick and God I'm asking you to touch my body I'm asking you to heal my body but if not you're still God where we get in a mess is where we prosper but we will start presuming huh there was a building of their faith there was a building of these boys faith we've got to go through we've got to go through things that build our faith Pastor, you're going to have to go through things. There was a process. They were prospering but not presuming. And there was a preparation. These boys didn't want to wait until the heat got turned up huh, to decide that they were going to stay with the Lord. They didn't wait until the heat got turned up to decide they were going to stay. True faith confesses the Lord before the heat's turned up. In the middle of the heat. And after the heat. True faith, it confesses the Lord when the heat's turned up. True faith confounds the enemy. You say, show me that in the Bible. Let me show you. King Nebuchadnezzar said, heat that boys. Heat it up seven times hotter than it would. Man, he was so confounded. He didn't understand these boys. He was so confounded because it would have caused them much more pain. And it caused them much more slowly to die if he had let the heat turn down. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He was so confounded by, by what these boys were standing for. He turned the heat up. So if, they, if the God didn't deliver them, boy, they was going to die instantly. Well, bless his name. Hey, absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Hey, listen to me. True faith, it'll confound the enemy. You say, boy, the devil's on my trail. Tell him you're just going to believe God. Tell him you're going to trust the Lord. True faith confirms the promises. Huh. Boy, it was an encouragement in the day of Daniel. Oh, think about these, the children of Israel. Man, they were living. Everything that they knew and loved had been took from them. Things tore down. They were living in Babylon. Many of them not of Babylon. Think about how, what a blessing it was. And it confirmed their promises. These three boys having some faith. These men brought the message to the Jewish people that God was still sitting on the throne. i got to ask you a question. We all go through those trials. It was preached on yesterday, the storms of life, when God doesn't answer, when God goes silent. Where are you at in your walk? People that are watching you go through your storm today, is your faith confounding the enemy? Huh? Is your faith confirming the promise of a holy God still sitting on the throne of grace? Hey, it's still a throne of grace today. Hey, we can go boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. It don't say go boldly to the throne of grace once in a while. Oh, 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 I love the DNA of this church. Well, you can learn some things from the praying people here at this church. Oh, yes, you come to victory. FBI comes in there and they want to see who's uh, who's touched us. Oh, they'll take a little bit of our prayer room. 
they'll take a little bit of my preaching and they'll find a little bit of Dan, Pastor Daniel. They'll find a little bit of Heath. They'll find a little bit of Tyler and Brother Jason. I listen to these, Brother Ethan. I listen to these men. I listen to them every Monday morning. Boy, that's how I feed my soul. I listen to preaching. Thank God for live stream. But I want to say live stream don't do it. The Bible says forsake not the assembling of yourself together as a matter of some is. But exhorting one another. We need each other in this thing. True faith that confounds the enemy and true faith confirms the promises that God has put in your heart. I'm done with this. The battle they faced, the building of their faith. This is probably my favorite part. The blessings that they found. Child of God, when the heat turns up, he's looking down. Oh, when the heat turns up, he's looking down. I remember when I was a young boy, my daddy... He was a fighter. He was a pastor. He was bivocational. He was a fighter. Well, he loved his family. He'd fight for his family. He's too many limp-wristed daddies now. Oh, he had a backbone. I was out in the yard one day, probably as a seven or eight-year-old boy. My older brother was probably 12 or 13, and he was out there with his BB gun, probably shooting things. He had no business shooting, Brother Tim. And there's some boys that walked our rows, man. They had them bracelets on. They were them spike bracelets. They were, they were grown men. They were 19, 20 years old, man. They'd wear their leather, man. They would dare you to look at them. As a little boy, I, I wasn't looking at them. Uh-uh. I seen them coming. I told Chris, my brother, I said, Chris, there are them boys come down there from Ringtail. I was like, we need to get in the house. He said, I'm not running. Boy, that was a mistake. I looked. And then boys dove off into the ditch after my brother. I, I, I run into the house and I said, Daddy! <laughs> well, it sounds like a coward now that I say it twice. I said, Daddy! I said, Chris, need your help, man. He jumped up and ran out there and then boys done got a hold of him. And Chris was running through the yard and his eye was bleeding. He said, let me tell you something, boys. I'm going to follow you to your house. I'm going to watch you all the way. Boy, we got behind them boys and we were going about two miles per hour. We was in one of them old conversion vans. Y'all remember them vans? Oh, yes. We was in one of them conversion vans. We were poor coming. We, we had what we needed, but we didn't have everything we wanted. But God gave enough wisdom and ability to my father to provide for his family. We got in that old conversion van and started finding them boys. Dad rolled up beside him and rolled down his window and said, You want to pick on somebody your own size? Oh, we followed him. Dad had his eye on him. Chris was in there with me. And Chris was like, Get him, Daddy. We got down there to them boys' house, little trailer. When Dad went and beat on that door, and that old man come out rough, probably lost, probably alcoholic or drug addict, little run-down trailer, and Dad beat on that door, and that man come out there. And Dad began to, with patience, tell this man what their boys had did. And I watched that man beat those boys half to death. Boy, our hearts began to break. I told Daddy, I said, Daddy, I don't know if I could have took much more than that. He said, Son, what you got to understand, in this life we have enemies. I, I Listen to me now. In this life we have enemies. But when you don't know I'm watching, I'm watching. I want to say to you, child of God, when the heat turns up, our Heavenly Father is looking down. Thank God. One of the blessings they found was the promise of the fire. Can I get a witness right? Anybody ever been through the fire? Oh, yes, a promise of the fire. Isaiah says it like this. I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by name. Thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. And when thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall flame kindle upon thee. I thank God. One of the promises of the fire is his protection and his providence. Thank God. Child of God, whatever you're going through today, pastor, whatever your church is going through today, stand consistent on the word of God. Understand that the devil is raging and it may not seem fair, but when the heat turns up, he's looking down. Promise of the fire. Well, we want to see the miracle, don't we, before the fire. But the power of God, listen, this is the power conference. The power of God is shown while we are in the fire. Huh? The power of God is truly shown while we're in the fire. Oh, the protection of the fire. He answered him as he threw him in there and said, Oh, I see four men loose. <laughs> Walking in the midst of the fire and they shall have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is likened to the Son of God. Oh, when the heat turns up, he's looking down. And finally, the promotion 
of the fire. You're going through something today. Pastor, your church being shook a little bit. There's some promotion on the back side of this thing. If, you, if you'll stay faithful and you'll stay true, there's some promotion coming on the back side of this fire. Verse 30, the Bible says a king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. There's blessings on the back end. Stay true to the Lord. Don't bow. Don't bend. About 10 years ago, I was coaching my daughter's softball team. And I, got, I was late. And I pulled in. I was late from, from work. And I got there, and the game had already started. And she was, on short, she was on third base. And I walked over to the fence, and I was watching the game. And I had some guys in the dugout. And I looked at the scoreboard, and it was 13 to nothing away. That means we was getting beat. 13 to nothing. I said, Madison, how's it going? She looked at the scoreboard and pointed. And I said, it's all right. She said, Daddy, I know it is. She said, Daddy, it looks bad. But she said, we ain't been up to bat yet. (laughs) Child of God, hey, let this conference be a place where you turn it around and you get to the plate and you said, I know it looks bad. I know it looks like the enemy's winning. I know it looks like the the society is going to hell in a handbasket. But listen to me. I ain't been up to bat yet. Get your Bible. Get faithful. Be a good steward with the things God's given you. Don't bow and don't bend. Pastor, you can. He didn't bow, didn't bend. That's why he didn't burn. Amen. Amen. Boy, ain't that good. I love that stuff. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's bow our heads a minute. Brother Tyler Hudson, get ready. Come over here and get this mic. I want to preach some of these young guys, young evangelists. You're going to give us about 15 minutes. going to try to get some of you guys in the rest of the week. Amen. Boy, I thoroughly enjoy that. Yes. When I first come to this church 30 years ago, Sunday, I come 30 years ago Sunday, and uh, took the church about a month later. First thing I did, I got permission. Brother Nick Annis, go up on that mountain and pray and take the women and the men. They never let women go up there. So we said, you got to dress right, so you ain't got to worry about that. So we went up there and started praying. And, uh, and then through the years, God worked it out where we could go down there at Myrtle. Went eight and eight, and I think about nine straight years. Went down there praying. So if God's ever around anywhere, there's a lot behind it. There's a whole lot behind it. But you got to start where you are. And where you start is preaching God's word. And then trying to rally just a few people to pray for you. You ain't going to get nowhere you do that. And then God will, get a, God will start saving some people just out of the blue, out of just nowhere. And then God will start building them. And then when they get built, well, God will save some more. Then start building them. And then sometimes God will give you a backdoor revival and God's got God's to clean out the church a little bit. You know, you're going to have them tired. You ain't going to get away from that. But thank God for people in another place. He's got young men down there, Brother Vaughn does, that would want, they want to preach every time the door is open. But before they preach, they're down there praying. They're backing up their pastor. Any preacher don't do that, ain't called to God. Amen. Preachers don't back their pastor up, ain't called. I don't care what to say. I don't care how much you brag about it. They ain't called. Because when you're called to God, you start bearing that load. And you back your preacher. And you pray for him. You don't sit around criticizing him, acting like you're his equal. You ain't his equal. No. Hey. I ain't get behind him. Say that offends me. You ought to get offended. Quit saying you're a preacher. You don't do that. Amen. Prayer room, every preacher in a church ought to be in a prayer room. Pray. Amen. You're going to get down the road what you put into it. i tell you one thing. You want my pastor used to tell us? If you lay man the preacher when he's preaching and you back him up, whether you amen or pray or whatever, there'll be somebody to back you up when you are. Some of y'all ain't never learned that. You ain't getting my amen. Well, keep you stinking amen. Hey! Talking about people. Won't that man of God do good? I mean, pull him for him. They ain't praying God. They ain't praying the devil shut him down. They want God to turn him loose. God, get on. Like Brother Raph, you say, oh God, my life needs preaching bad. 
My youngers need preaching. I need preaching. Oh, God, get on my preacher. We got to have it. What happened to people like that? To go to church to get corrected. Oh, God, let me know how to get closer to you. You know what's wrong with us today, Brother Vaughn? We ain't got no time. I ain't got no time to preach 10 minutes, you know. I ain't got no time. I ain't going to wait on God. You, you got to soak in this thing. That's why we have these services. So you can soak in it. Get all that world out of you. Most churches on Sunday morning ain't nothing but production. It ain't much of that. Just entertainment. To entertain a bunch of carnality. Church takes time. Church takes time. Amen. Praise God. So I'm glad you're sticking with it. Hey, man, here's one of God's choice young men. Where's Brother Tyler at? Hey, man, huh? come up here. Praise the Lord. Don't hold against him who his daddy is. <laughs> hey, I appreciate men like him. Hey, man, I appreciate his. Y'all, are y'all engaged? Oh, okay. I appreciate it. Slow. Hey, man. Praise the Lord. I love you, son. Hey, man. I pray God might have sent you out. He's already doing it. He's full-time, full-time evangelist. Amen. He's even got a prayer man, ain't you? Yeah. Got a prayer man. Goes with him and prays. And that man quit a real good-paying job to put his life into him. Now, ain't that so? Amen. Amen. How you like that? Hey, man, won't somebody else do good? If the man of God does good, you're going to do good. Yes, sir. God gets on him, he'll get on you. God get the why, why are people so stupid? Why are people so stupid? Hey, pulpit, turn loose. God will get turned loose on you. Amen. God bless him. He'll bless your family. Yeah, amen. Hey, man, you, pull, you back in God's church and God's man, you just being good yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Amen, brother Paul. Ain't that right? Boy, you can feel it when people pray for you, can't you? I'll be going down the road on Monday and I say, now pray for me. Man, I'm in that car of praying. I feel it coming, Lord God Almighty. I feel them prayers, buddy. When you get sick and can't pray for yourself, you feel them prayers. Yeah. You know why God won't let you pray when you get sick? Because he'll let you know you ain't in this by yourself. You got to have God's people. God will always let you know you got to have God's people. They ain't nothing like them. They might be having backslid on God, but God will hear when they pray for their preacher. Oh, God, pray for somebody sick. How y'all like this? We're not just here to be entertained. I'm here to instruct some of y'all. Yeah. That's what we're here for. Amen. I'm here to tell you some things God's taught me. And the problem of our day, people won't listen. You got a lot of these sorry preachers. Well, you can't help them. You can't help them. They ain't got no ear. They don't hear what you got to say because they know everything. I won't give you 10 cents in hell for that. Amen. Amen. Learn from men been down the road. Yeah. That's what you do, ain't it? Amen. Try to. Why ain't you preaching yet? <laughs> Brother Tyler Hudson, get his autograph where he gets famous. Uh, if you got your Bible, go to the book of Psalms, chapter number 73. Glory. Psalms 73. Hallelujah. And I uh, felt like a grandkid standing with his grandpa just a minute ago. <laughs> and uh, he towers over me, makes me scared to death. Uh, but Psalms, chapter number 73, I want you to look with me in verse number. Uh, 25, and I'll be quick and get out of the way. It says, Whom have I in earth, heaven but thee? And there's none upon earth that I desire beside thee. Uh, my flesh and my heart faileth. Isn't that the truth this morning? But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For lo, they that are far from thee shall perish, and uh, thou hast destroyed all them that go a whoring from thee. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I'm going to read it again. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. Lord, we love you. God, we thank you, Lord, for who you are. God, I ask, Lord, that you'd give us grace this morning. God, that you'd bless us and use us and touch us, Lord. God, may you speak to these people, Lord, as you spoke to my heart. Lord, I love you and I thank you. And in Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen and amen. We find here in Psalm 73... 
uh, that the Bible tells us that the writer is a man uh, by the name of Asaph. You study Asaph's life, and Asaph was the chief musician. He was the worship leader in the church, uh, Brother Jody. He was the man that would get up uh, when they got in the temple, would lead them in the song. Uh, if anybody was supposed to be right with God, it would have been Asaph. If anybody was supposed to be close to the Lord, it was Asaph. If anybody was supposed to worship every service, it was Asaph this morning. But we find that this entire psalm that is written, it is Asaph struggling in his heart. Uh, Asaph, the worship leader, has somehow, some way, gotten his eyes on the wicked. The first four or five verses will tell you he was envious of the wicked. He wishes he was like the wicked. And we find that Asaph is looking at the world, and all of a sudden in his mind he starts thinking, man, I'd just be like they are. I'd just, what's the point in going to church week after week? I just do what they do. He's getting in his mind that he's asking himself the question, why is it that the righteous suffer while the ungodly seem to prosper. Why is it that he's serving God with everything he's got and he's praying and he's shouting and he's worshiping and yet the world's down there and they don't give a rip about the Lord. They don't care about the house of God. They don't care about the word of God and yet it seems like everything in their life, Brother Eddie, is going absolutely wonderful and Asaph's gotten to the point where he's just ready to quit this morning. He's going through, as the Brother Vaughn said, the heat's turned up and he's just ready to throw in the towel and he's done this morning. But can I just say thank the Lord that by the end of the psalm, Asaph finally figures it out this morning. I'm glad though Asaph for all these verses has struggled back and forth, Brother Daniel. I'm glad Asaph finally figured it out by the end and he wrote the words in verse number 28, but he's saying in spite of it all, but it is good for me to draw near to God. Asaph said, I may be suffering and I may be struggling, but it's still good to draw near. He said, the world might be having everything they want and I might be struggling in my life, uh, but it's good to draw near. Can I say there's times in life uh, I get to looking at the world uh, and Brother Jody, I think, why is it that they don't have a lung collapse? Uh, why is it their back's never broke? Uh, but I'm glad that every now and then uh, the Holy Ghost comes by and reminds me uh, that it's still good uh, to draw near to Him this morning. I'd say we might suffer, but it's still good to pray. We might struggle, but it's still good to pray. And in spite of all the world's got going on, it is good to draw near this morning. It is good for me to draw near. Asaph didn't just say it's good. He says, Lord, it's beneficial for me to get closer to You says, Lord, I've surveyed the world and I've came back just to look at you and there ain't nobody like the Lord this morning. It's good for me to draw near to Him. For a few moments, I want to preach on that thought. It's good to draw near. And uh, you say, preacher, why should I draw near? Why should I get closer? Can I just give you three ways? I know for a fact that it's good to get closer to Him. I'll give you to you quick and then I'll sit down. First, I want you to notice it's good to draw near simply because I know Him this morning. Simply because I know Him. Look at me in verse number uh, 25, if you would. He says, Lord, whom have I in heaven but Thee? There's none upon earth that I desire beside Thee. Now, wait a second. This is the same fella that in the first half of the chapter has been saying, Lord, I want this in the world. Lord, I want this in the world. God, I want to be like them. I want to be like that. But he finally gets to the end of the psalm and he says, Lord, I've looked at everything they've got and I've already figured out there ain't nobody like you this morning. And Asaph quits looking at the world and starts looking into another world. And when he looks up in the other world, he says, Lord, there is nobody I desire besides you. There is nothing I I want but you. There's nothing greater than you. Can I say this morning that the greatest reason I need to draw near is simply because on May 15 of 2008 on that Thursday night on the left side of that altar on an old bell of hay up Campbell's Creek Road I knelt down and met the Lord and He came down inside of my heart and I got born again that day. What more could I want this morning? What more could I desire beside Him this morning? 
Can I say, I don't understand why some of these folks take off and run to the world, Brother Jody. And the I mean, as soon as the first sign of trouble shows up, they get up and they run out the back door and they never come back. Do they not understand that the one living inside of me meets every single need this morning? I'm glad when I'm hungry, he's the bread of life. When I'm thirsty, he's the living water. When I can't see what's next, he said, I'm the light of the world. I'm glad that the Lord is everything I could ever need this morning. Say, there ain't a paycheck that could ever beat him. He owns the cattle on a thousand hill. And I say, there's not popularity that could ever try and pull us away from him because he's the fairest of 10,000. He's the greatest that's ever been. Do you understand? I'm not worried about the dollar, not worried about making money because I serve the King of Kings uh, and the Lord of Lords. Uh, what more could I want? Uh, I know him this morning. Secondly, I want you to notice, not only am I going to draw near because I know Him, but secondly, because I know my heart this morning. Because I know my heart. Look at me in verse number 26. <clears throat> he says, my flesh and my heart faileth. He says, Lord, if I'm not close to you, I'm going to fall. But notice this, I love this next part. But God is the strength of my heart. He's saying there in that psalm, Lord, if I do it on my own, I'll fall. But when I've got you and I'm close to you, everything's going to be all right. And say there's a crowd out there that tells us we ought to follow our heart and believe whatever the heart says and uh, just let the heart lead you. Do what you feel like doing. And I love what Brother Tyler said yesterday. I don't worship when I feel like it. I worship based off of the fact this morning. But can I say that the Bible tells us over in the book of Jeremiah 27 and 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it and I say this morning you better understand if you try and preach in your own flesh try and sing in your own flesh try and pray in your own flesh you're not going to make it this morning but we've got to be close to Him I've got to walk closer with Him because I understand and know that if I'm not close to Him then I'm closer to the devil and the farther I am from Him the closer I am to fallen this morning and if I don't have fellowship with the Lord day in and day out if I don't pray and study my Bible every day then I'm surely going to fall this morning can I say we've seen it time and time again where a preacher's prayer life starts slipping and his Bible reading starts slipping and all of a sudden his speech starts slipping and his holiness starts slipping and before you know it he's out of the ministry and his life's blown all to pieces uh, because he wasn't close uh, to the Lord this morning I've got to walk with him or else I'm going to fall prey to the devil this morning. See, I love to watch the National Geographic channel and watch them animals as they get on there and uh, they do those documentaries. And I remember I was watching one, uh, the one in Africa. That's my favorite one because it's blood, guts, and gore. And you ain't got to feel convicted about watching it, Brother Daniel, because the Lord's the one that created it this morning. But I remember I got to watching it and I noticed that there was a flock of animals that were running together, a herd of people. And Brother Cody, as they were running, the lion would not jump into the middle of the pack to kill one. He wouldn't run up to the front and kill the one in the very front, but that lion would start walking around the back and wait for somebody to start drifting behind. And as soon as he got one that wasn't close enough to what he needed to be close to, uh, he'd pounce on it and its life would be ruined this morning. Say it's the same way with the devil. We all know it, but the Bible says he's a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour this morning. It does not say he gets to devour one, but he's looking for one that he can devour. But the truth is if I walk closer with him if I draw nigh to him he already said he'd draw nigh to me and if I walk with him then it will guard me and protect me from the wiles of Satan this morning. But lastly I wanted to rush and get to this so I made sure I gave it to you. Is Not only do I know it's good to draw near because I know my heart and I know him but lastly because I know who it's going to harm if I don't this morning. Know who it's going to harm if I don't. Look at me in verse number 15 if you would. <clears throat> David, for the first 14 verses, has, or Asaph, for the first 14 verses, has been wrestling <coughs> and struggling. Verse 15 is the turning point of the psalm. Verse 15 is when now his focus shifts from the world and back onto the Lord. Notice what he says. He says, if I say, I will speak thus. Meaning, Lord, if I do quit, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. We find that Asaph, then look in verse 16, he says, When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. 
We find, remember I told you that Asaph was this morning, Asaph was the worship leader. Asaph was the man that would get up every time and would lead them in the song, would lead them. And like we said, if anybody's supposed to be close to the Lord, it's Asaph. And I can't help but think Asaph, one of them Sunday mornings, gets up behind the pulpit to lead them in a hymn. And he's sitting there and he might be there physically, but spiritually and emotionally, he's in a faraway land somewhere thinking, Lord, I ought to just quit. I ought to throw in the towel. I ought to be done. I ought to just give up. This is, this is dumb for me to be here. I'd have just quit. But then all of a sudden, Brother Jody comes back to himself and can't help but see maybe Asaph looks to the back of the sanctuary and there's the children of the church that are back in the back of that church. And he looks at them maybe in his mind. He says, Lord, if I quit today, what hope do they have tomorrow? If I don't draw near now, then how in the world can I expect them to get a hold of God? If I don't get close with Him now, Brother Jody, if I don't persevere, and if I don't bend and break and do everything that Brother Vaughn just said, if I quit now, how can I expect them to keep going? How can I expect them to carry the banner? How can I expect them to go farther? If I don't make it, what hope does the next generation have this morning? Say it do us a lot of good. And Brother Daniel's taught us that it's not just about us this morning. I don't go to Myrtle just for me. And the first time I went, I thought that's what it was about. We got down there and got to praying for people in my family. And God started doing things. And it showed me, Brother Daniel, this thing ain't just about me this morning. But the reason we get close to Him is because there's a lot of other people that are depending on you and I this morning more than what we know. I wonder, wouldn't it be wonderful if the Lord could just show us for a moment who it is that is depending on you and I to get closer with Him this morning. I'll give you the story and I'll sit down. But uh, you've all heard my dad's testimony. I was saved out of drugs and alcohol and all of that stuff. And uh, how God saved him and God saved my mom and God saved me and changed the whole course of our family's direction. Uh, but what he doesn't tell a lot of times or what a lot of people miss out on is what I want to tell you about this morning. His dad will tell you that whenever he was lost and going to Marshall University, about an hour or so drive to get back to his house, Brother Daniel said he drove drunk, I believe nearly a thousand times is what he said. Drove home drunk as could be brother eddie he said he never got pulled over never got in a car wreck you don't think that's the grace of god this morning then i don't know what is uh, but never got in an accident said he'd drive home and he tells the story says he remembers he would get there to the house and he'd begin to sneak in and he'd walk into the living room and he'd look and there'd be my grandpa and my grandma asleep on the couch and he'd go real quiet brother he slipped back to his room and think i made it by him again they didn't they didn't know what i was doing i, I slipped by him thank goodness they were asleep But it was not until years later that after he had gotten saved that he realized that they were never sleeping a single night, Brother Daniel. But whenever he was driving home drunk, whenever he was out there living like the world, he said that he'd come in and thought they were sleeping. But the truth was that my grandpa and grandma were down there on their faces and were saying, Lord, would you please save him? God, would you please keep him safe? Uh, God, would you please touch his life? Call him to preach. Use his family. God, I'm asking you, Lord, to save my son and there was not a time brother Jody that they slept but they were drawing near on behalf of somebody else this morning and I can't help but think that today my dad's preaching I'm preaching my brother's preaching mom speaks uh, and Lauren goes around and sings uh, and it's not because of us this morning it's not because of anybody other than the fact there was an Asaph uh, up on the hill somewhere that decided they draw uh, near to him this morning and I say I can't boast in anything that I'm doing this morning it all goes back to the prayers of somebody that didn't even know me didn't even know who I was but were down on their face night after night after night can I say I'm glad that he didn't quit this morning I'm glad grandma and grandpa didn't quit praying I'm glad that day after day when there was no answer and there was no hope that they prayed again and again and again because the Lord sure did hear their prayer this morning Can I say, I don't know who it is that you might have been praying for for a long time, but it ain't time to quit now. It's time to draw near this morning. I wonder, would you say with me, it's good to draw near this morning. Amen, they've been in here practicing. Lord of God, ain't that good. Amen. Amen. I said, "Ain't wasn't that good? Amen. How old are you, brother? 
21. Man preach like that at 21 years old. Because he walks with God. He quits walking with God, he'll lose that. He never gets proud, he'll lose it. He never gets distracted, he'll lose it. He never gets thing you better than anybody, he's going to lose it. Amen. Looks in the mirror and sings how great they are, he done lost it. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. Y'all ready? Amen. So, hey, y'all say something in Mike. Let's make sure we got them on. Check, check, okay. check, check. How are you, Lauren? There you go. <laughs> Hallelujah. God save, oh I God save, I'm redeemed by the mercy of Jesus, I'm amazed by the goodness of the Lord, I'm restored and made right, He got a hold of my life, I've got Jesus, how could I want more? I've received nothing but goodness. I've tested and tasted your grace Till I fell at the cross I fell at the cross and got saved Oh, I got saved Deemed by the mercy of Jesus I'm amazed by the goodness of the Lord I'm restored and made right He got a hold of my life I've got Jesus, how could I want more? I'm redeemed by the mercy of Jesus. I'm amazed by the goodness of the Lord. I'm restored and made right. He got a hold of my life. I've got Jesus, how could I want more? I've got Jesus, how could I want more? Jesus, how could I want more? God's got it all, ain't you? Amen. Amen. Y'all appreciate the Lord today. How do I be saved? Listen, how would you ever, ever, ever let the try to explain to the world what we got? I can't, I can't understand it. Amen. How you like preaching? That's what this meeting's about. It's about preaching. Because there's power in it. A lot of times you, you hear preaching, you don't know what's done to you. You don't know you get to heaven what's done to you. But it might be in the very thing, give you the strength. Amen. Say no to that next sin. Yes. Being in church with the fellowship of God's people might just give you enough strength. Yeah. Not to mess your whole life up. Amen. That's why church is important. Yes. Amen. Yes. So I appreciate you being here. Amen, boy, these services have been wonderful. Preaching been wonderful. I love to hear these young girls up here. They're all young. Amen. Well, Lauren, you're still a teenager, aren't you? Sis, you're still a teenager? Amen. Sis, Abby, how close are you? <laughs> Amen. That train done left the station, didn't it? Oh, Lord. Praise God. I know America's going to hell when they quit having a caboose. Yeah. Train don't look right at that little red car. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's why we go up there. There used to be Western Carolina Center every year to look at the lights. They still got the caboose lit up. Yeah. Amen. How many know what a caboose is? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Oh, it takes time to worship God. It takes time to serve God. I'll tell you something. These are little drive-by services we got. Oh, come on. Come on. Where you don't never go in and dine. Yeah. 
Fast food. They ain't getting the job done. They ain't getting the job done. God wants you in the, in the dining hall. He <laughs> wants you to come by. Lord God, I think over live stream, that's fast food. There ain't nothing like being here. Yeah. Nothing like being here. For one thing, you see other people still living for God. Had it all to charge you. Amen. See other people love God. I'll charge you. Always ask God to give you an encouraging word. An encouraging word. Glad to see you. Glad you're here. A lot of times you don't say it, you just act like it, you know. You know, you, you always tell the church uh, that loves each other because you can't hardly get them to go home. Church is over, some got to go get sleep. There'll be some hanging around, you better about cut the lights out to threaten them, you know. Lord God, somebody got to sleep tonight. Because I mean, they've been talking, they've been texting all day, or talking on the phone, then come to church, and that ain't nothing. They got to hang around after church. And why? Why? Because of that sweet fellowship. Amen. Your soul longs for it. When you walk with God, you so long to be around spiritual people. People that will charge you. That iron sharpened the iron. Amen, Brother Tyler, you come. Praise the Lord. Lord, don't we always enjoy hearing him? Hearing all these men. All of them. Glory to God. You preachers, stay ready the rest of the week. Thank you, sir. All right. I uh, want you to take your Bibles and go to the book of Psalm 83. And uh, this morning, I want to talk to you on the silence of God again. I want to apologize about the Christmas carol situation yesterday. I... Uh, I heard y'all had to sing a few last night, and I do apologize for that. Jason texted me in the middle of the service, and uh, he said, thanks a lot. <laughs> so uh, I won't tell you some of the other stuff we've sung down there, because I don't, I don't want y'all to have to go through some of that, but um, I greatly appreciate it. I want to help you as be as practical as I can this morning. We've already heard so many good messages. Um, the messages this morning on Daniel... And then that message that Tyler just preached, I'm going to be honest, I got nervous. I really thought I had the mind of God, so I wasn't too nervous. But when he said, I want to talk to you about Asaph, I'm, I'm going to read out of the book of uh, Psalm 83. And Tyler, when I, when I opened up my Bible and, and, and you said, Psalm 73, I need to talk to you about Asaph, you took like that much of my introduction this morning, so I'm going to skip right to the message, but... He actually opened my eyes to something. That's how you'll know the Holy Spirit is in the house. Because He'll use the messages to open your eyes. And I'd never thought about something until He talked about Asaph being that chief worship leader. And I want you to read in the book of Psalm 83 with me, verse number 1 and verse number 2 and verse number 3. Watch what Asaph says. Keep not thou silence, O God. Hold not thy peace, and be not still, O God. For lo, thine enemies make a tumult, and they, hate, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against thy hidden ones. I want you to notice in verse number 1 what Asaph says. He says, Keep not thou silence. David yesterday said, God, do not be silent. Asaph says, God, I don't want to hear your silence. These are two different words that seem to indicate the same thing. But you do understand they're two different words. In the Hebrew, they're two different words. In the English, they're two different words. But they really have the same idea. What that means is this. You and I can go through the same thing and we can look at it two different ways. How many times have you ever been battling something, dealing with something, going through something, and you talk to somebody and you know they're talking about the same thing, but yet they're describing it in completely different terminology. And what they're saying, you know they're trying to help you, but it just ain't clicking. David and Asaph are describing the same things. Now, if you remember David, the Bible says that David was a man who was after the heart of God. Yet every time we read Asaph, Asaph, though he probably was a man that was after the heart of God, and he was a man that had the heart of God, he was a man that had a broken heart. 
And you'll read and find whenever you read whatever this dear brother said about Asaph being the chief worship leader. And yet he was a man that was always dealing with something broken. Here's what you'll find about people that are truly anointed. This is what God showed me. This is what you'll find about people that are truly anointed to lead people in worship and song. They are highly volatile in their emotions. They may not be outwardly emotion, but you'll find they have massive mood swings. Sometimes they'll, they'll be really angry, and the next time you come back, man, they're as, ha- as happy and holly and jolly as you'd ever want to be. Then there are times that those people may not have mood swings like that. There are people that are really excited, really giddy, really on top of things. Next time you know it, they're all bowed up like a blowfish. You know why? There's something connected with those emotions and that anointing. I can't explain it. I'm just telling you, I've been around long enough to tell you that some of the most anointed people who are singers are some of the most highly volatile emotional people you'll ever want to meet. That's why you'll find that music programs in the church often breed the greatest problems in a church. Because they're high. Now, some of y'all act like I'm making this up. If you've been around church any amount of time, you know I'm telling it right. It's just the facts. And Asaph was one of those. And that's why you'll find whenever you read the Psalms of Asaph and this sweet psalmist, this is the last time in chapter 83 you'll ever see his name attached to a psalm. And the last time he's attached, this is the first thing he says, God, please don't be silent. God, please don't get me to that place Well, you don't talk to me anymore. Brothers and sisters, I remind you this morning that if you walk any amount of time, there will be a point in your journey when God goes silent. Now, whenever we're talking about the silence of God, like we said yesterday, it's that meaning and that idea that God's not guiding, God's not leading, God's not giving that word of direction, God's not telling you what's coming, God's not telling you why it's coming. And whenever God goes silent on you in your life, and whenever God goes silent, I can already tell I've made the music people upset right now. Your volatile emotions have swung you to the other side of listening to what I've got to say. Now, here's what I'm telling you. When we say that God has gone silent, you will be there at some point in your journey. And when you get there, you'll find three things in verse number two that will will happen. Number one, you'll find that when God goes silent, the fears in your life will intensify. Watch what he says in verse number two. He says, lo, thine enemies make a turmoil. That word turmoil, it's the sound of the noise of war. Whenever they would hear the drums of war or they would hear the hoofbeats of the chariots that were coming, they called it the turmoil. That was the sound that that the, the, the enemy was on the way. Whenever God goes silent in your life, you'll find those things in your life that you're afraid of, they get bigger. You know when you're on top of the mountain with God, you don't worry about money. You don't worry worry about God providing. But when God goes silent on you, all of a sudden what you've got coming down the way it gets bigger in your life. You know when you're on an altar somewhere and God gives you a word through a message that doctor's report doesn't really bother you. But when it's been a while since you've heard the leading and the voice of God, all of a sudden there's a lot of what ifs that pop up in your mind. All of a sudden when you get a fresh word from God and you know that He's going to save people and you know He's going to help the church, You've got no fear. You've got no anxiety. But when it's been a long time since you've had that fresh word from God, you hear that turmoil. You hear that noise of war. Those fears in your life, they get intensified. And you'll know you're in that place because what you did not fear all of a sudden is getting bigger and bigger and bigger in your life. Number two, your fears will intensify, but problems seem to be never ending. Watch what he says in verse two. He says, they that hate thee have lifted up the head. Now watch what he says. He does not say, he that hates thee. He says, they. Now in my Bible, they is always plural. It's always more than one. Isn't it an amazing thing that when God is talking to you and God's guiding you, you can't think of a problem. In fact, when God gives you a fresh word about jumping into evangelism or jumping into pastoring, people will say, well, what about this? You'll look at them and say, God will take care of it. 
But when it's been a while since God's spoken to you and God's gone silent on you, all of a sudden it's one problem and you get that problem handled and it's another problem and you get that problem handled and it's another problem and those problems seem to mount on top of themselves and you say, God, everything's piling up against me and everybody's coming against me and everybody's flaring up against me. It's because the problems are never ending when the silence of God is all you can hear. But number three, the worst part of the silence of God is your value is questioned. Watch what he says in verse 3. Watch this last phrase. He says, They've taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against thy hidden ones. That phrase right there, hidden ones, it's the Hebrew word which means the jewels hidden in a hope chest. You see, the way that God views you and I, He takes us when we're born again, when we're saved, and He hides us away. That's the idea of being sealed by the Holy Ghost. That's the idea of being a jewel. You see, God views us as the precious one, the hidden one. Now watch who they take counsel against. They take counsel against the hidden one, the precious one. Listen, when God's talking to you, you know you're special. When God's talking to you, you know He loves you. When God gives you that word that it's going to be okay, you know God really thinks about you. Can I ask you a question? How do you feel in your relationship with God when it's been a week or two or three? You start doubting yourself, don't you? You start saying things like, God, am I really right? God, did I really hear? God, did it, was it really that? God, was it really that word? Lord, am I ready? And all of a sudden, you'll start doubting those promises. And when you start doubting the promises, you'll start doubting the position. And when you start doubting the position, you'll start doubting the value. You know, people all the time, they'll say, I don't know how so-and-so fell. I'll tell you how so-and-so fell. Rarely do people fall when God's speaking. People start falling when God goes silent. Because the promise you heard... You haven't heard it in so long. Now you doubt what God... Brothers and sisters, listen to me. I promise you right now. I promise you right now. You will walk away from God not when you're on the mountain, but when it's been a while. God, where you been? The silence of God will make you question what God really thinks about you. Now, I want you to notice something. When will God question? And I'll give you four times right quickly when God will go silent on you in your life. Four things, write them down. Then I'll give you the three little points at the end. And these will be so practical at the end. But you say, when will God go silent in my life? Number one, He'll go silent when you cruise through the Bible. He'll go silent on your life during a time of wrongdoing. You remember the book of Judges chapter 16, verse number 20? You've got Samson and man, he's fighting for God. He's filled with the power of God and the Spirit of God's upon him. And all of a sudden the Bible says this, he wist not that the Spirit of the Lord was not upon him as at other times. You see, God had pulled off of him because he sinned. Now watch this. Many times when you wonder about the silence of God, you'll say, God, have I messed up? I promise you. If you are wondering if you've messed up, you haven't messed up. Do you know why? Because if you have a child that comes to you and says, Daddy, are you mad at me? How many honest daddies will look at that child and be mad at them? And they're truly wanting to know. And you look and say, I'm fine. I'm fine. If you are that kind of daddy, you're a bigger baby than the baby that's asking you. And I tell the church this all the time. God's a big boy. If you want to know if you've messed up and he don't tell you, it's because you ain't messed up. People that mess up are not wanting to know if they've messed up. God will go silent though during a time of wrongdoing. Number two, God will go silent in your life during a time of weighing. Do you remember in the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 32? The Bible says that the Babylonians come down to Hezekiah and the scripture says, and God left Hezekiah that he may know him in the matter of the Babylonians. We homeschooled our kids for two years. We couldn't handle it anymore. I couldn't take it anymore. I, I couldn't take it and I wasn't even there. I traveled more during that time than I've ever traveled. I couldn't take it. It just, it tore my nerves up. The best thing I ever did was put my kids back in school. It was the biggest peace of mind. But you know, testing time. Now look, if you don't, if you don't like that, then you don't have my attention span. I don't know what to tell you. 
But something my wife always did when it came testing time. Whenever she would give a test to them, she would say, now, before we start this test, do you have any questions? Because once the test starts, I can't talk to you. You see, there was a standard in that testing curriculum that whenever the test began, the child had to take that test because the purpose of that test was to gauge what that child knew and what that child didn't know. It did no good if that parent helped that child because then you didn't know what the child knew, you knew what the parent knew. And my kids, it, it never failed. No, I think I'm good on the questions. That test would start. And you'd hear those little pitter-patter, them eight-year-old legs run out of that room. Ella would say, Mama, I got a question. And Eric would say, I'm sorry. Go back and take the test. The principal is always silent while the test is going on. If you're in a place right now and the weight is so heavy and the hardship is coming against you and you can't find God and you don't know where He's at and you can't figure out why He's gone silent, it's because you're in a time of weighing. Number three, God will go silent during a time of weariness. First, First Kings chapter 19. You remember Elijah? He had to go 40 days in the weight and the power of that meat. Why? He had to go in that because he was too tired to get a fresh word from God. People always ask, they'll say, Preacher, is God mad at me? First question I asked, when was the last time you took a nap? Why? Because we as American believers have got this idea that the more we do, the closer we are to God. And sometimes you can be so tired that you're not in the place to get a fresh word from God. You say, is God gone silent? I don't know. When was the last time you slept? Some of us go to bed at midnight, we wake up at 4. Some of us go to bed at 1, we wake up at 3. Some of us run 18, 19, and 20 hours a day. God never intended for it to be that way. There's a reason God turns the lights out at 6. And what did man do? We went and created a light bulb so we could just keep on going. During times of weariness, God will go silent. Number 4, during times of waiting, God will go silent. Can I ask you a question? Hello. Let me ask you a question. Why would God tell you something that it's not time to tell you something? Me and a preacher were talking about this verse in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse number 27. The woman's son dies and she brings the son to Gehazi and she says, where's the man of God? Gehazi comes to Elisha and he says, Elisha, the woman that you promised the son to, her son's died. And Elisha makes a statement. God has kept this from me. God went silent on me in this matter. Why? Because if God had told Elisha that the boy was going to die, Elisha very well may have tried to usurp that death. And had he usurped that death, God would have never been able to allow him to bring that life back. God will go silent on you when it's not time for you to hear what He's got to tell you. So some of you are there, and I know that. I'm going to be real quick. Let me give these to you. What do you do in those times of silence? I'll give you three things. These are spiritual. Yesterday were practical. What do you do practically when it's time for God not to speak? you got to keep praying. you got to keep worshiping. you got to keep trusting. But what do you spiritually do to make sure that you don't dry up on God? What do you do spiritually so that you don't get lost on God and get out of the way on God? Three things. Number one, the first thing you've got to do is you've got to find relief in the spoken word. You see, not when you can't get a fresh word from God from the written word. You'll get in a service like this and these guys will get up here and preach and man, Vaughn was, Vaughn was preaching. I just could not help but think all the times I've been in the fire and somebody would preach those words and immediately when they would be preached to me, they'd bring joy. But when I'd walk out the door, I'd get right back in those problems. Because there was something about the fact that it was spoken to me. I had a hard time keeping it as I walked out. Can I ask you a question? Don't lie to me this morning. I've been around you too long for you to start lying to me now. How many of you have ever been blessed in a service and you knew God had sent a preacher to talk to you? But when you got in the car, you started battling the very thing the preacher preacher brought you joy. What's the deal with that? What's the problem with that? Because we, for some reason, don't view the spoken word from the same place. 
that the written word... Now, look, I'm not equate. You know what I'm saying. But can I give you a verse in Jeremiah chapter 10, verse number 23? Here's what Jeremiah says. He says, it's not within man for him to find his own way. So therefore, if that preacher preaching that book gave you some type of joy, where did it come from? It had to come from God. Because it's not within you and I, Jeremiah said, for us to create our own way. But isn't it an amazing thing how whenever a preacher will give you joy, I listen to Heath preach some of these night services, and man, they're walking right down the path that I'm stepping on. And I get off line and I get off the service, and the first thing I start doing is start talking about how it doesn't apply to me. Yeah, I know, but that, that's not exactly what I'm dealing with. That's not, I, I understand he's talking about that, but my situation is just a little bit... You've got to learn how to find relief in the spoken word. You've got to learn whenever God has sent a messenger to talk to you. Can, can I ask you a question? Is nobody else finding that most of the preachers are saying the same thing nowadays? Most of the preachers are saying the same thing nowadays. Very few times is anybody getting up saying, you must be born again and thousands coming to the altar. Most of the preachers I'm hearing right now are getting up looking at the people of God saying, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. You're going to make it. I wonder why they're all saying the same thing. Could it be that God is trying to send through the prophets of God the same message? Isn't it amazing that Micah and Isaiah prophesy at the same time and pretty much talk about the same thing? Because that's what the people needed to hear. Listen to me. You're going to have to learn if you're going to make it in the silent times with God to find rest in the times of the spoken word. Number two, you're going to have to learn how to find refuge in the last word. Abraham, you'll have a son. Bye. God doesn't talk to Abraham according to our Bible for one whole year. Abraham, you're going to have a baby. Tell Sarah. I'm not going to tell her. You tell her. Sarah, we're going to have a baby. Really? God doesn't talk for another year. During that year, do you know what Abraham does about halfway through? He listens to his wife. And through listening to his wife, he messes up his entire life up through our day. Do you know why? Because instead of resting in the last word, he tried to get a new word. You better stop that stuff. You say, where did that last word come from? It came from the God of glory. What do I do now? Just wait on that one. Stop trying to make that one come to pass by getting a new one. Can I ask you a question? What you doubt about that last word is not what he said, but it's what he didn't say that we doubt. What do I mean by that? Abraham, you're going to have a baby. I know that, God. When? And because God didn't give us everything we wanted, we start trying to make stuff happen. I'm going to be honest with you. I rarely doubt what God does say. Most of the time I doubt what He's not saying. It's the fact He doesn't tell me how it's going to come to pass. He doesn't tell me when it's going to come to pass. So instead of me getting all these doubts about what He's not saying, I've got to learn how to take refuge in what He is saying. I've got to learn how to take refuge in what He did say. Stop trying to figure out when and start rejoicing in what. Stop trying to figure out how and start rejoicing in the fact that He said that He would do it. You've got to learn how to take refuge and say, God, I don't understand the whole plan. I'm talking to myself right now. God, I don't understand the whole plan but I'm going to rejoice in the part I do understand. Can I ask you a question? When God told Abraham, you're going to have a child, go tell Sarah. Do you know what he wanted Sarah to do? He wanted Sarah to make a baby blanket, not make a baby. Sarah started trying to figure out how to make a baby, and God wanted her to make a blanket. Too many times, God doesn't want us making the baby. He wants us making the blanket. He'll say, I'm going to bless your church. You know what God wants us to do? God wants us to figure out 
where we're going to put the people when they come. But what do you and I start doing? We start trying to figure out how to get to people. And instead of having a church full of sheep, we've got a flock full of goats. Stop trying to make the baby and figure out how to make the baby blanket. You've got to take refuge in the last word during the silence of God. You say, well, I don't know when it'll be time to move. I'm pretty sure he's big enough to tell you. He'll show you when. Number three, you're going to have to learn how to find rest in the coming word. The Bible says in the book of Luke chapter 2 that there's a lady waiting in the temple. To the best of our knowledge, the best of our knowledge, only two women in the entire temple complex we ever read about. One of them, her name is Anna. The scripture tells us that Anna is in the temple. Now, you can read it however you want to, but the scripture and Bible commentators say that from the day of her virginity, she was married for seven years. She was only married for seven years and she was widowed for 84 years. That would mean that she waited in the temple for 84 years. Why? Because she'd been told that Messiah would come. Time out. Let me give you two applications right here. Number one. I guarantee you when her husband died after seven years of being married, she thought her world was done. But in order for God to take her where he wanted her, something had to die. She would have never gone to the temple. Do you know why? Because it wasn't the law for the women to go to the temple three times a year. It was only law for the men to go to the temple three times a year. But the reason she went to the temple is because something she loved died. Just because God's killed something in you, by you and through you, doesn't mean he's done with you. 84 years. Why did she go to the temple? Why did she go to the temple? Because, because the last time that she ever heard anything about a Messiah, it was that he was going to do a work at the temple. And so she said, you know what? I'm going to be in the place where I know that the coming word is coming. I heard he's going to come right here. So when he gets here, I'll be waiting. Eighty-four years. May I ask you a question? And I'm only asking you because I've already asked myself these questions. Why do you feel like it's too late? Why do you feel like it's too late? Why do you think God's waited too long? Why do you feel like that they've not been saved in enough time? Why do you feel like it hasn't opened up when it should have? Why do you feel that way? I'll tell you why I feel that way. Because my plan fits my life. And your plan fits your life. God's not interested in rubber stamping anybody's plans. I don't even know why I'm preaching. I'm normally a happy guy. I'm normally a pretty excited. I love what Brother Jason said yesterday. He said, I love to encourage people every now and again. You know, I, I, I usually try to encourage people. You know, one of the most discouraging times of my entire life has been when I don't know where God is. Now, don't, don't tell me you always know what God's doing. You don't have any idea no more than I do. You can't figure out how it's all going to come to pass. And the most disappointing times of Tyler Curtis's life is when I think I've got it figured out and that pathway blows to pieces. It's when I think that next piece is going to be the, the key that turns it all. And then all of a sudden, it blows to pieces. It's when I think that person's going to be the one that opens the door and they're the ones that turn on you. It's when that next situation, that's going to finally be what opens up Pandora's box only to realize, I don't even know where the box is. I wonder how many people came into the temple, Anna said, there he is. 84 years, I guarantee you every Passover, she thought, this is the time. 84 Passovers, 
came and went. Do you know when Jesus finally came to the temple? Eight days after he was born. Do you know what day he was born? Now, we, I don't have any idea. I don't have any idea, neither do you. Don't, don't, let's not get into all that. She thought he was coming on a holiday called Passover. What she had no idea is that God was about to create a new holiday. You and I think that God has got some specific plan and thing He's got to make happen and God's trying to do an entirely new thing in your life. So all Anna could do... Come on, Austin. Help me, son. All that God could do was wait on Anna to get in her place every day. And all Anna could do was be in her place every single day. And I don't have any idea why I preach on these things. I've got a whole series of messages that probably could have raised the roof and raised the rafters. I'm done raising rafters. I'm wanting to build warriors. I'm wanting to see people that have enough power and have enough faith to march to the gates of hell with me. And in order to do that, you're going to learn how to live in the silence of God. My question is this. You will not climb the mountain during the silence of God. And I'm not asking you to. What I'm asking is, do you still have your climbing shoes on? Are you so upset that the baby's not there, spiritually speaking, that you've stopped sewing together the baby blanket? Why are, you, why are you not planning anymore? Is God... Stop worrying about your plan and start saying, God, Passover's come and gone, but I'm still standing here. The silence of God. The silence of God. The silence of God. Take refuge in the last word. Find rest in the coming word. Just trust Him. Let's stand together this morning. Surely the Holy Spirit deals with us. Let's find us a place while Austin sings. The quiet moments where God doesn't move. It's going to be okay. We'll make it. We'll be fine. We'll be okay. Clouds are disappearing. Skies are turning blue Only just a while ago I told Him I was through He did not Sweet embrace He picked me up and carried me Into a field of grace Where all is quiet Face 
strong winds, but I don't mind them all that much, for I know He'll come again and lead me to still water. soul has been restored in his healing field of grace where all is quiet leaning on his breast he pulled me from stormy sea to a place where I could rest. He told me I was loved. He told me I was safe. And I could stay you to think, don't it? Well, think about Tyler. He's always going to be on a, on a different page because he's got, different, got a different intellect. I mean, I thank God for being like it. I mean, we need that. We need the cornbread. We need it all. And brother, what, what, two things I really got from that. I like that blanket stuff. Brother Paul, you know why God can't bring sinners in most churches? They're so cold. There ain't no blanket there. There ain't no warmth there. There's no care there. There's no example there. Just people just act like they're mad at God and mad they're saved if they are, you know. So God's got to prepare the blanket. God's got to get the temperature right. And Brother Vaughn, where are you at? Hey Amen. I heard Adrian Rogers say this. He said they... Old Nebuchadnezzar might have built that fire. God had his hand on the thermostat. <laughs> hey, Amen. Praise God. Don't that encourage you? Well, oh, we've heard some good stuff. Another thing I got from that he was saying, I thought about Mary. So the Lord puts big dreams in your heart, just like Abraham. It's going to be a while for him to get there, and God's going to make sure the flesh can't do it. God. Abraham had to get where he couldn't produce a child. Now, after Hagar, he just got out of business. He couldn't produce one. Sarah never could. She started from her birth. All her life barren. But when the flesh couldn't do it, when Abraham couldn't help God, God helped Abraham. Amen. So what do you do in the midst of that waiting time? You do what Mary did. You ponder on these things. And what you start doing, Brother Heath, you start watching People God brings in your life. Truth God reveals to you. Like if you're a pastor, people God bring you to church. Yes, sir. And there's a reason. We, listen, only God can build a church. Yeah, right. You do know that. If you build it, it'll, you might grow fast, it'll fall fast too. Yeah. Yeah. God's got to build it. God to give you key people. Brother Vaughn, before y'all ever do what you're doing down there, God's putting the key people in there. Ain't he? yes, sir. You see it. Yes, sir. You see how it's going to happen. You know what? You say, well, I think God wants us to Start if you want to start a bus ministry. Don't start one you got the workers. Yes, Once you start something, try to find somebody to do it. Yes, You're going to mess up. You wait till God sends you the people. Amen. And God sends you the, then you start seeing the direction God's going. Right. And then you start feeding that flock. But what, uh, what Brother Tyler said there is what's so frustrating our day. And I was talking to a, a Brother Kissler last night. You know, we were raised as boys. Boy, that man of God talks. You know, that's God talking. And so many preachers done messed all that up. They done messed, preachers have done this to us. 
I mean, up preaching while they got a girlfriend in the backyard. What are you talking about? All this inconsistency. And they mess it up. But if you can find a man who walks with God, full of the Holy Ghost, God speaks to you. Why do we don't pay any attention to that? I mean, a man study all week. You get set in the power of the Holy Ghost, preach your stuff. People ask that like, well, we're at the buffet bar. I don't want that. Don't even pay no attention. All that word's going just a water on the duck's back. Ain't nobody, hey, that word's given to obey. <laughs> and the preacher got to obey first. So, are they, tell me if they're ready over there. I'll quit rambling here and trying to fill time. Hallelujah. But always watch if you've got a God's manual pulpit. You watch how God's leading him. You watch what you are. they ready? Uh, you watch what God's doing for him. If he's getting excited, you better start getting excited. Right. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. He starts seeing things. God's going to show him. Yeah. And then the praying people, God will affirm it. Yeah. And sometimes God will show people things, and then he'll show the man of God. And they say, man, I've been praying about that. And that reaffirms what God showed him. Yeah. That's the way Dr. Ray was, that old man down there, you know. And uh, old Cold Harp down there at Myrtle. And he come up to Brother Ray. He said, Brother Ray, God, I've been praying and fasting two, two, two years. And the Lord showed me young people all over these grounds by the thousands. Thousands of people saved and men called to preach. And uh, God was, uh, God's already stirring Brother Ray about that. Just reaffirmed it through somebody he had confidence in. And he told it at the right time. And that's what God did. Last I heard, man, it's back in the 80s. There'd been 2,500 men called on those grounds. Not counting all of them. Got, I got called down there and didn't surrender down there. I know about 2,500 surrendered down there. But that place turned out the preachers. Amen. And God let it all happen for his glory. But all those years there, they're pondering and waiting on God and waiting on God to supply the need and supply the people and to give the credibility. Dr. Ray had to have work. He had to have nationwide credibility to do what he did down there. You can't just do his stuff if you people don't know you. If they ain't got confidence in you, walk with God. That's what the church says. God lets the church watch a preacher a while because there's so many phonies and frauds now. He'll let a church watch a man a while to see if they can put, it, put their hat on him. And you've got to understand that we're living in such demonic days that, that the devil don't want you having any confidence in nothing no more. Oh, God still got his men, still got his women that pray, and still got his people.